it's been E3 in the last week, which also makes another anniversary of my show. Um, I actually should probably look to see how long I've been doing this. Um, <laughs> but it's been a while. So, it's time since E3 has come and gone. The time has come to talk about, well, my thoughts on the the show. So, I've been doing E3 since 2011. So, this is my, like, sixth year anniversary. My time flies. So, I'm just going to do one video here with my picks for the show, the sold and unsold. Now, this is not a judgmental thumbs up, thumbs down. This is a case of, from what I've seen of these games and this material in this, at E3, there has been enough to get me interested enough in these games to pay attention to coverage further and to consider a pre-order or purchase once the game comes out. Reviews pending and all the other stuff, that sort of thing. With the games I am unsold on, this does not mean I will absolutely positively not get them or get things from this publisher, but there is a certain more of a barrier for me to go over to get there, to get those things. So, let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. Because I want to end on a high note. These are in no particular order. They're just general whim. And the also list is The Crew 2. The Crew was a game which caught my interest before because I was hyped at the idea of a racing game, an open-world racing game that lets you go anywhere in the, Uni in the continental United States. Yeah, you wouldn't get to race in Alaska and that sort of thing, but... I was looking forward to the idea to basically being able to race in my home state, which is something that nobody's really done in a racing game before. And the game didn't really do that. It, it hyper-compressed the country to such a degree where... I understand having to do a certain degree of compression due to requirements of storage, media, and that sort of thing, and making so that you didn't have to drive for actual days of nothing across the United States. But on the other hand... When you're actually literally removing states from the system, from the country, to do this, it's kind of less enticing. Part of the appeal for this is, I get, for people, is I get to race in my home state. Whether that's driving through the Cascades in Oregon, or in Iowa... Um, doing drag racing out there and, and muscle car stuff. And so I didn't expect major story progression in every single state, but I expected like a race or two. Um, drag a sprint through the Willamette Valley in Oregon or something like that. I expected that my state would have a race or two. I expect if you're in the United States and your state was not represented there, that your state would have a race or two. But it was not the case, and I was kind of bummed about it, and I was actually significantly bummed by that. And the Crew 2, their response to this is basically, rather than putting more time into building a bigger United States, is we're going to do more race types, not just with cars, but with boats and airplanes. Or airplanes, rather, I'm using the British pronunciation. And my response is, why do we need the airplane races? Boat races, maybe. But the airplane races seem a bit much. So, that kind of, that, that failed to go over the hurdle of what my experiences were with the first The Crew game. It didn't get across to me, hey, we are actually going to live up to the promise of the first game and build a bigger country basically, a bigger environment for you to race through. I hope that the inclusion of planes does ultimately mean that, that yes, we actually will have a larger country for you to drive across, but, or fly across, rather, with the expectation that flying actually means something here. But we'll see. I'm not super hyped for it. I'm going to, if I pay attention to this game, it will be kind of in general passing if it happens to come up. Next up is Days Gone. Speaking of things from relating to Oregon, because Days Gone is developed 
in Sony Band Studios out in Bend, Oregon, which is, I believe, Eastern Oregon. Um, so the crew two are the didn't the like, Oregon's not present for Gaze Gone. It's kind of at a good. I, I will give the credit for this. It does a good job of capturing a Northern California, Southern Eastern Oregon vibe for the game's environments, which fits with the fact that the game developer is based out of Bend. But we've had a lot of different takes on zombies lately. Now, the game Days Gone is trying to certainly get across this take on zombies and get right a new spin by having zombies as a sort of environmental hazard, uh, like moving in a collective swarming hive mind thing, which is certainly kind of different. It reminds me of some of the images of the zombies from the World War Z movie. But the difference being that for a game environment and for an environment with the zombies, it, it doesn't work for me in terms of how I want to experience the zombies in my horror in, in my horror game. My preferred take on zombies is zombies as actual threat themselves. Not just, oh, humans are the actual monsters, zombies are something we can deal with and get around, and the only reason that society has collapsed is not because, oh, there are zombies, it's because, oh, humans are terrible. And the game is going, we're going to be going th kind of through that tack in terms of the ultimate narrative, because we have the zombies basically, the environment is, they are a passive obstacle until you do a thing to either set them off or direct them. And I'm not a fan of it. I think probably my preferred take on zombies in, fic in video game fiction, aside from the Resident Evil games themselves, particularly the, like the first, f the main four, is. Honestly, The Last of Us, where the clickers, the fungal-infected zombies there, they felt like a very real, active threat, and you had to approach the zombies and people in incredib using incredibly different tactics. You could contend with them if you had the right resources and planned properly, but you definitely had to vary up how you handled problems because of how the zombies perceived the world. With here, the impression I get with the zombies is the zombies are coming after you. It's a fail state. You're done. You you might as well just restart from the last checkpoint. And the game hasn't done anything to sell that concept. And this is especially a big deal because it, cause it's an open world game. And where open world games put their checkpoints can kind of be a rough thing. So we will. So again, this is a case where. Further messaging from the developer and from Sony could spell out that, oh, this is actually, like, my concerns are less of an issue, but they're still there and I'm still going to voice. Next is Sonic Voices, some forces. I'm not a fan of 3D Sonic games. The lock-on targeting always feels a little, it's either not good enough in terms of requiring a degree, in, in terms of requiring a degree of skill to line up your shots, or too good, where either, either it doesn't provide the utility to line up and target your enemies with your jump attacks, or just auto-targets them and you just keep going, and the game becomes very auto-playing. And I'm not a fan of that. I grew up as a kid playing the 2D Sonic games, and we'll get back to this, and the I recognize sort of the degree of skill and memorization there, but kind of focusing a little more on the skill related to dealing with enemies and that sort of stuff in that game, with the idea that speed is a reward for good play. And this, and instead, from the impression I get from Sonic Forces, the attack they're taking is sp speed is a way to show spectacle. And the gameplay demos they've been showing 
have predominantly been big, flashy, loud, noisy, busy scenes where if you're trying to pay attention to gameplay and control things, then the spectacle gets in the way of that. And you, and you either can't pay attention to the spectacle because you have to pay attention to the gameplay, or if you pay attention to the spectacle, you are not engaged in, in the game. And it's kind of a nuisance. It didn't work great in uh, Sonic Generation for the 3D stages, in my opinion. I'm doesn't look great here. And adding the ability to create your own friend for Sonic doesn't help. It it feels like like I I don't know. It it doesn't work for me. Next, kind of lumping together. The Devolver Digital Short Film Pseudo Press Conferences Conference. I have enjoyed some Devolver Digital games. This press conference, or short film, I'm not going to call it a press conference. It's not a press conference. It's actors and actresses presenting a couple of trailers in a semi press conference like environment, but very staged. People in the audience are actors. They weren't necessarily interacting, interacting with what's actually happening on stage. Um, and I believe it was deliberately edited that way. So, what bugged me about this is a couple points. One, the tone of it is very too cool for school. Hey, hey. Those big, stupid press conferences with, with the Sony and the Microsoft and Nintendo... We're so much better better than them. We're we're going to show you how we're so much cooler than they are. We're the best. We're huge. We're making gaming great again. Um, not actually not really that. It's like it's it's this active nudge nudge wink wink. You see the joke. You see the joke. You get the joke. Hey hey hey. That was a joke there. Get the joke joke. And a good joke is one where you don't need to call attention to it. I'm, I, I can understand doing larger-than-life personas. I'm talking here wearing a wrestling t-shirt. I can deal with larger-than-life personalities. But the context of larger-than-life personalities and the stuff matters. It's one thing... And, and so when you're doing this pursuit of press briefing... It stumbles and kind of falls flat. And yes, companies have tried to do big, larger-than-life personalities in their stage. I remember when Ubisoft trucked out Mr. Caffeine. Ugh, that was a thing that Ubisoft did. And, the pro and I can understand wanting to kind of poke fun at that. But the difference is, when you're poking fun at somebody else's missteps that they've noticed were missteps and have stopped doing, it doesn't work as well. And aside from that, from the game standpoint of the games, these were the games that I'd already seen before. Like, actual trailers that were available like weeks, like a couple weeks before the press conference. Or games which kind of weren't really, weren't really interested in. Like, we had a Serious Sam twin-stick shooter. And when I saw this, the response I had wasn't, oh, hey, a serious damn Sam Six Shooter. It's like, my response was, man, it's been a while since the last actual Serious Sam game. When are we going to get another one of those? Particularly with this increasing boom of the Gonzo Spectacle first-person shooter that Wolfenstein is coming back. Doom is back. Wouldn't this be the time to bring back Sam? But that's, we're, we're doing this kind of very low budget, well, not necessarily low budget, but this pixel art inspired um, twin stick shooter. And much as that's nice, but where's the actual first person shooter? That's what I'd like to see. And finally, in the unsold category is. The new is the variety of South Park games we got. It wasn't just we got the fractured butt hole. We got a bunch of other mobile games 
and all sorts of stuff coming up from Ubisoft. Them basically going, hey, we have the Ubi, we have the South Park license. Our last South Park game did really well. Let's make a whole bunch more of these. And there's a couple issues here. Is from a comedy standpoint, South Park can be really, really hit and miss. And this isn't just, oh, depending on who else is writing, or if you put someone who's not Trey Parker and Matt Stone in the writing chair, even Trey and Matt can, like, really fall apart on their face. Like, like a freaking triple 720 somersault face plant screw up. And this is on their show. So, when you're dealing with a video game, and a lot of video games, if you're getting Trey and Matt really heavily involved in the writing process, this doesn't necessarily mean quality. And... Additionally, when it comes to characters to put at the forefront of South Park, Hartman's an antagonistic figure. He has always kind of meant as an antagonistic feature, but from a marketing standpoint, He's been shoved into the Bart Simpson, Bart Mania role. And this has kind of come to the forefront for me, having been playing through Nintendo Power Retrospectives and seeing Bart Mania run wild throughout the 90s. And now we have South Park pushing Eric Cartman in that role and in the games. And the thought is, if you're doing a South Park game and you want to have a sympathetic character to push at your forefront... There are other people. There's... And this is the part where my knowledge of South Park runs down. Um, I mean, the Kyle is probably the biggest one to mention, because Kyle is the de facto protagonist of the show. And... I wouldn't mind if it was Kyle driving at, at the forefront of the, the narrative here, but it's... So very Cartman, and Cartman is one of those characters... Where the show, where the show really can either really do well or really fail, like really fail in a tone deaf manner. But there's also a bunch of other characters. That, well, I mean, South Park is a show again. It, it's very uneven and can fail really spectacularly and be really tone deaf in a lot of really dramatic ways that perhaps the only show that can come closer to it to utterly just screwing up and spectacularly exploding when it comes to covering and doing episodes about sensitive topics is Family Guy. And yes, Family Guy and South Park have incredibly passionate fans. In fact, probably by saying bad things about this, I will get a tremendous number of views and a tremendous number of hateful comments in the show notes, or in the comments below. I'm certain of that, but South Park as a show is something which can just really spectacularly screw screw up. And the games really need to kind of get across to that, hey, we're actually paying attention to this and we're trying because we're putting this out in a much bigger medium to recognize where South Park has failed spectacularly in the past and try to avoid these atomic landmines while still having actual comedy. And I worry about this because there's just so much stuff coming out and I remember all the South Park games for the N64 and the PlayStation. And I think we even got them for the Game Boy. And we got them for... I think we got a couple games for the Dreamcast. I'm pretty sure every system got a slew of South Park games, and they were terrible. And I see this happening all over again. And Ubisoft is going to have to take significant pains to get across, hey, we know this, we're aware of this, we're going to try really hard not to screw this up the way it's been th this new era of tons of South Park games. 
the way they have been spectacularly screwed up in the past. And this is why I brought up South Park's spectacular screw-ups in the f- earlier, for the show's actual screw-ups, is that the show has had, and still has, problems, the significant problems with spectacularly screwing up Will suddenly having Trey Parker and Matt Stone now actively involved in management of the franchise in video game form pretend, preventing for these spectacular screw-ups? No, they're probably not. It's still going to happen. And ultimately, the spectacular screw-ups of South Park were not fun because they were bad comedy. And bad comedy is pain, isn't just bad, it's extra bad. Because you can't even mock it. And I see that happening again here. So, with the negativity out of the way, let's talk the enjoyable stuff. Let's talk the good stuff. Again, these are not in any particular order. First off, I mentioned there's Sonic Forces. I was an old-school Sonic fan. I went over to my friend's house in grade school and middle school and played Sonic the Hedgehog on the Genesis. And I enjoyed it. And once I had access to a Genesis of my own, one of my first purchases I made sure to get was Sonic 1, 2. And I believe I have... No, I don't know if I have 3 or not. Uh, but getting a bunch of Sonic games. So, when I saw Sonic Mania get announced, and it's the fact that it's from the Freedom Planet team, a team which basically was trying to make their own Sonic clone in the vein of making Metroid clones like AM2R or um, Axiom Verge. Seeing that the game, now we're doing, that they're doing an actual Sonic game now, and they put a lot of thought of what made Sonic work in the past and how to make it work in the present with HD systems, that has me really paying attention to this. And seeing some of the stuff they've done here, like fire shields burning away the spinning um, spike log things, and that sort of stuff has got my attention and has given me hope that of the new pixel art Sonic games, that this, as opposed to, say, Sonic 4, will really nail it. Fingers are crossed. Next up is Griftlands. I like science fiction. You may have noticed this from watching my show in the past and all the science fiction novels I've covered all the science fiction movies I've talked about, and the fact that I'm currently doing a Let's Play of Mass Effect Andromeda. And so I saw Griffin, I was like, oh, hey, it's a kind of a science fiction RPG, and it's got a combat system somewhat inspired by, like, turn-based Japanese RPGs, like Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, and except taking a page sort of from stuff like Child of Light, where it's a Instead of a pixel art style, it is the sprites are more conventional drawn art. And it looks really neat. I have yet to get any real information about the story, but I'm hoping that as we learn more about the story, it will get interesting and it will get more interesting and we'll see how the narrative shapes up for this, whether it's a linear narrative or it's more branching, or if it is very freeform. Again, we'll see how this turns out. Next up is Battletech. The new Battletech video game does a thing which previous Battletech games have not done. In that it tries to actually replicate the Battletech tabletop game. We have had plenty of mech simulators. The Mech Assault series, we've had the more arcade style stuff like uh, Mech Assault. So, first person Mech Warrior, third person Mech Assault all general thing of you're driving, you are driving a single mech around an environment to take on enemies, you may have some squad or wingman commands. We have had real-time strategy games during the real-time strategy boom with Mech Commander. All these games are really good and really enjoyable. And the, honestly, the Battletech franchise has a really good, solid track record for putting out enjoyable games. And now we are getting a Battletech turn-based strategy game where you are commanding your squad of mechs turn-based environment a la XCOM with the difference being that whereas with XCOM all the environments are kind of more blocky both even going all the way back to the uh, PC version 
here we have ro you have rolling hills, canyons, natural environments that you're moving your squad through, which is kind of I suspect where the barrier has come in with the mech warrior games and doing them turn based and or mech the biotech games and doing this turn based in the past is handling cover and all this stuff in a terrain environment that is much more naturalized than what we normally think of in terms of um, the terrain for a cover-based shooter and figuring out what counts for half cover or full cover when you're dealing with rolling hills as opposed to more blocky environments, like craters or an urban environment and that sort of thing. So we'll see how this works out. I have hopes. The team that's done this is the team that did uh, the Shadowrun Returns series of games, Shadowrun Returns, um, Shadowrun Dragonfall, and Shadowrun Hong Kong, and those games turned out fairly well. Shadowrun Returns, narratively kind of weak, but had a good, strong mechanical framework for the other two games to build their narrative on. And we'll see how Battletech shapes up in terms of its story. And we'll wrap up with our two big AAA titles. First off is God of War. I've not been a fan of the God of War series in the past. They feel like the bad 90s comic of character action games. In the sense of that these characters are mean and like Kratos is mean and angry and violent because being mean and angry and violent is cool. Say what you will for, like, Dante in comparison to Kratos. Dante cracks wise. Dante has a certain degree, he gets, has a setup in cutscenes of an ethical code. Da Whereas Kratos is like, whatever, I kill whatever gets in my way in order to get what I want, and I'll kill anyone, anything, anywhere. And Kratos in the new God of War, he's still angry. But he's mellowed, and it actually creates more interesting narrative potential, because now the story isn't Kratos is angry; he's going to kill a thing. It's there's more involved, there's more narrative depth and weight to the story here, and I appreciate that. And it actually, cause I like playing video games for the story, not just for the action, and I want to see how this turns out. Again, this game could do something spectacular to poop the bed later, but we'll see. It looks really good. It has set up a interesting world that is different from the generally gray and bland world of the first God of War games. Because it's like there's like trees and lushness to, to Greece. Yes, there's plenty of stones and ruins, but there's stuff there. And God of War, original God of War games made Greece look, and for that matter, uh, Mount Olympus look incredibly bland. Finally, Wolfenstein II: The New Colossus. I really liked Wolfenstein: The New Order and Wolfenstein: The Old Blood. They were interesting stories. Uh, the Old Blood was. Kind of a very pulpy story in the vein of the classic Wolfenstein game, but with that very world-weary tone that they'd set up for Blaskovich in the original series, in the, in the uh, main game. And Wolfenstein The New Order did some interesting stuff with the world-building and basically doing the um, Man in the High Castle thing. And basically taking some cues from from Philip K. Dick and Men in the High Castle that made it work. And I like to think the fact that Wolfenstein did well um, kind like Wolfenstein and Man in the High Castle on, on the Amazon series, the two series doing well, have kind of get done a good job of getting a good idea of what this world under occupation would actually look like. And so when we're getting Wolfenstein the New Colossus, where we're after 
taking on the Nazis in Europe, we're now going back to the United States for a new American revolution. I think this expression they use in the trailer. It's been a while since I watched it. Um, it looks impressive and exciting, and I'm interested to see how this turns out. This could turn out very well. One can only hope. So, there are plenty of other games which I, which I saw trailers for, and gameplay footage of from E3, from home. There are more than a few things which I, I had to cut from my list to make five games for each list. I had to cut Metroid Samus Returns, which looks interesting, but I didn't get to see more gameplay footage, so I can't speak for it to the same degree of passion. I cut 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim because I love Vanillaware games, but I haven't seen enough of gameplay of this to really make a comment yet. So, keeping in mind that there are games I cut that I was also really interested in and wanted and want to see more about, or games that just really didn't interest me at all but could surprise me later. With all of that in mind, what games from E3 got you pumped? Let's try to weight this on the side of positive feedback. What shows, what games really caught your interest at the show and are you and that you're looking forward to seeing more about what games sold you on a system what games got you excited post the post it in the comments i will respond in kind and see you next week Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.